Klein said the meeting was at 11, 11 p.m. That's what I, what I issue going on. I don't know what time zone that was, Larry. I know that could be the issue. No, it was Europe different... somewhere. You know, I I sent out a, I sent out a message to to to, re to to join my particular thing, and it was out through Outlook. And what it did was it looked at the computer it was sending to and gave them the local time. Yep. Which means it was not right in some cases. Okay, so uh, why don't we get going? So welcome everyone. Today is October 28th, 2020. This is the Amherst Conservation Commission meeting. So we're just starting a few minutes late because of technical difficulties, but I'm sure we will make up for that. And so with that, um, no comments from me. So Dave, do you have something you'd like to add? Yeah, just a couple of quick updates. Um, let's see, it's uh, really, it's trees, 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 down trees. It's all about out in the field, down trees right now from all these micro, micro bursts, these, these fast moving storms, Brad and Tyler have been uh, quite consumed. I'm gonna guess we probably have a hundred trees over trails right now, but they have been uh, really just uh, teaming up on these kind of tiger teams and and uh, they sent me a bunch of pictures. I'll try to uh, send some to Erin and she can send them, send them out to you all. But um, they've been working in South Amherst uh, recently, um, just trying to get caught up. And then they were up on uh, near Puffer's Pond as well this week. They're also doing quite a bit of brush hogging. <clears throat> this is that time of year where we try to, um, you know, uh, get as much brush hogging done as we can. We avoid those areas where we know we, in particular, that we have um, box turtles. So we wait until typically after the first frost, uh, November 1st, first frost, when box turtles have already headed to where they're going to spend the winter, which is typically in, in wetlands. Um, they're out of the fields. So we'll be hitting places like, um, 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 oh boy, I, I shouldn't have, shouldn't have uh, gone down that track because now I'm going to blank. Uh, um, there's a couple of places in South Amherst off of Southeast Street where we have um, box turtle, small box turtle uh, uh, populations. And then um, we help out Shootsbury out at Atkins Flats. We typically wait uh, until late there. Uh, we also try to avoid um, uh, wood turtle habitat as best we can until late in the season. So it's perfect. I mean, we're going to get a, a little storm, a little uh, cold temperature snap right down into the teens, I think, this weekend. So that should send a lot of the turtles uh, toward the wetter areas that we don't mow. So trees, down trees, brush hogging. Um, I got a report today that Brad did team up with the Coles company and they got in the Story Walk um, oh. posts. Oh, I think there crazy. are eight, I think there are 18 of them up uh, between Mill River Recreation Area and Puffer's Pond and um, I believe that Coles will be working to put out the, you know, you, you all approved that installation. So Coles will be putting out um, the, whatever holds the, the stories themselves uh, on those posts uh, ASAP. We are still finding it a little bit challenging out there in, in Mill River, uh, along the Mill River with this, this gentleman who is making the, um, uh, what do you call them, Car Karens? you know, the rock sculptures. Uh, we continue to get a lot of uh, concerning emails about him and his work both in the streams and, and on land. So um, I was up there, I don't know, a week or two ago and it, it, it is reaching that point, I think, where we need to try to, try to get a better handle on this. Um, he's cutting down a lot of, a lot of um, uh, live uh, material in the forest. And so I've asked Brad to see if we can ask around up there and see if we can have a conversation with this gentleman. I, I know it's also come to a head. <clears throat> Some people have approached him directly and others are simply uh, taking down the rock sculptures. Uh, so uh, the rock uh, 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 Karen. So um, I wanna make sure there's no, you know, we don't have some sort of altercation up there as well. So um, we'll keep you posted on that. Yeah. Dave, and is then, this like, is this the um, outflow of uh, Puffer's Pond, that area? Yeah, right below, yeah. Okay. right below the Puffer's Pond Dam for a good couple hundred yards, this gentleman. Yeah. I think he lives in the area and, and I don't know his circumstances, but I, 
I think he just has a lot of time on his hands. So he he's made at one point, I think somebody said there were over 200 um, in the stream, along the stream, taking rocks out of the stream. Uh, he made a large nest, a large bird nest. I might have told you this at the last meeting, but it's uh, getting to that point. So we may ask, um, you know, we may ask uh, other local sources if we can see if we can lean on them a little bit because this is not something I've encountered before. Um, let's see, the only other update I had, uh, the CPA committee is now meeting. Um, I actually did not submit anything this round of CPAC um, for CPAC funding for, uh, typically we would, um, you know, we, we in most years we have a land acquisition project and then uh, we often ask for money for trails. Um, but again, with just trying to complete three land acquisition projects. So we, we bought the Zala pro property in North Amherst. We bought the Keith Haskins property off of Market Hill Road and Hickory Ridge is pending. And I really felt as though um, given workloads, given the COVID environment um, and that, that really there was nothing ready for prime time in terms of land acquisition. And to be honest, um, we have a lot of um, unspent trail money right now. And um, I want to make sure we spend some of that in 2020 and 2021 before we go back to the CPAC. Because CPAC is getting, uh, they're, they're more organized than they ever were before. So they're very aware of um, uh, unspent balances. And um, uh, we need to spend down on some of that money to improve bridges and, and trails and whatnot. So, and parking lots. So uh, parking areas at trailheads. So we're gonna do that. And then we'll go back to them in 21 uh, for some additional funds. I, I will say, I think it's the first time in 15 years that I haven't submitted anything. So it took every ounce of my control not to put in a request. And Fletcher knows having sat on that um, committee for, for, for a long time, um, uh, they're they're very um, they're very attuned to to funds that are still out there pending uh, uh, projects being completed. So those are my quick updates. Dave, do you know roughly how much of the excess trail money there is? I mean, we're talking ten thousand dollars, hundred thousand dollars. Oh no, it's probably in the twenty to twenty five thousand dollar range. Okay. Um, you know, it, it goes fairly quickly. I mean, uh, you, you start doing a, you know, crushed gravel, crushed stone parking lot with, um, with kiosk and, um, and uh, split rail fence. I mean, very quickly, you're up in the ten to $12,000 range. We also, we did, um, along those lines, we did, we were able to order a number of uh, new kiosks. Uh, some of them have arrived and some of them are uh, in process, um, but we used, uh, some of them were ordered with CARES Act money. We found out that that was a, a legitimate um, uh, expense under CARES Act. So we did order some additional kiosks that we can replace old kiosks or try to get a consistent uh, presentation at all of our trailheads with new kiosks. So. I think 21. Dave, I, not I noticed that, uh, that my, I keep on getting questions down here in Orchard Valley about Hickory Ridge. And I noticed there was an auction yesterday at the at restaurant equipment. So things must be moving along there pretty good. Yeah, Hickory Ridge is, is in fact, I have a conference call on it or a Zoom call tomorrow um, on Hickory. Um, you know, I've been saying this for a while, so I don't really want to, you know, I, I sound a little like a broken record, but this is a this is one of the more complicated land acquisition uh, mm -hmm. projects I've ever worked on, particularly when you have the yeah. solar solar involved. So be. yeah, yeah, everything is on track. Um, I think tomorrow's call is specifically to update the town on where the the owner is with solar. Um, we're ready. Uh, we don't need any more votes, as far as I know. We do not need any more votes to acquire Hickory Ridge. You voted. Uh, the CPAC voted, the town council voted. Um, so the, the funding is available. So we really need the owner and his legal team to move this forward as, as quickly as they can. Um, so I, again, I, I'd say the next two, two and a half months is, is a likely scenario. Yep. Aaron and I 
are working with them, uh, and that'll be part of the call tomorrow. Uh, we're working with them to get a little more information on what their plans are with regard to 21E, the 21E site, which is, you know, uh, they have a, a, I would call it a modest contamination issue related to underground storage tanks and, uh, um, uh, you know, just uh, ab uh, routine uh, maintenance of vehicles and, you know, oil on the ground, things of that sort. So that's uh, back down, that's back down behind where they're storage area was yeah that's where they stored their their equipment any of the mowers pretty standard it's you know particularly when you have underground storage tanks it's like any frankly yeah. it's like most gas stations in this country yep are 21 e sites because you can never contain all of it so yep. we've got to work through that a little bit so those are my quick updates great thank you dave any questions for dave Okay, so Aaron, the floor is yours and oh, we're just about at 7.30, so I didn't. Um, so should we just start our 7.30 at this point, Aaron, or is there something you want to go? Um, I could actually do one really quick item. I don't think it's okay. anything um, that the board's going to take issue with. We got a... Um, a request uh, land use application and I had spoken with Dave in advance about it. Um, a um, an individual who wants to do play acoustic music one to four musicians at Amethyst Brook in the field um, I think once a week um, I know that musicians already do this at Groff Park once a week <laughs> and without permission so I don't know you know um, we figured we'd run it by you guys but it just seemed like such a benign request um, to have people playing music in the field yeah, Joan uh, approached me about it first. And so I asked her to just submit a form. I didn't think there's any issues with it, but just so we're kind of all aware. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, I thought just for consistency to have you all review it and take a vote and, and then we could just be con consistent across the board. Because we do get, you know, people want to hold a small little concert. They want to hold a wedding. You know, these, these things come up all the time. So, yeah, did anybody have any questions? I mean, so they're not doing it for money. They're just going to be sitting out there for the dog walkers, for whoever. Did you say when? Mm -mm. Okay. No, she doesn't know. It's going to be kind of ad hoc. Okay. We might want to go. <laughs> yeah, that's why I was asking. <laughs> it's also getting cold out, but we'll see. Yeah. If you hear Brett, will you email me? Sure. Will do. Yep, I'll ask Joan next time I see her. Thanks. So we just bring dogs without leashes? <laughs> <laughs> only, only before 10, Fletcher. What's that? Only before 10. Yeah, I got it. Got it. <laughs> I'm going to mute myself now. <laughs> OK. Um, so if there's no other questions on it, um, so we'd be looking for a motion to approve the application. I move we approve the application for music in the field at Amethyst Brook. Second. Second. Okay, so voice vote. Leroy? Aye. Jen? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Larry? Aye. Laura? Aye. And I for me as well. So we are good. And yeah, I look forward to seeing it as well. Great. Okay, should we move on to our 730 at this point, Aaron? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so if you are from the public and you are here for our 7.30 agenda item, which is the backyard ADUs for Kelly Light at 34 Baker Street, if you can raise your virtual hand and then we will promote you to panelist. So, oh, you even put backyard ADUs in your name. Wow, you're good. Okay, um, so let me formally open this. This public hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protection of wetlands as most recently amended in the Town of Amherst Wetlands Protection by Law. This is a notice of intent for backyard ADUs for Kelly Lake, proposed 790 square feet detached supplemental apartment and a 600 square foot barn inspired studio 
and parking at 34 Baker Street, map 13D, parcel 46. Um, and so Chris, um, welcome. If you wanna give a brief background on your project and then we'll go over to Aaron for additional details. Oh. Let's see if we can get Chris unmuted. Hmm. I'm hitting the unmute button, Aaron, but it's not unmuting. Can you do it from your side? Yeah, I just I just clicked it. I think Chris might have to do it. Maybe we're like going back and forth. Yeah. Chris, can you try to unmute yourself? Yeah, there should be a little microphone button somewhere that you hit. You got it. Hello. You got it. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yes, we can. <laughs> Sorry, sorry about that. I was uh, fiddling with the, uh, the mute button. Um, so I'm happy to give a quick overview. So we are, uh, we're pro proposing to build a, uh, a, supp a detached supplemental apartment for Kelly's uh, mother who's moving back up to Amherst from New Jersey, uh, just to be closer and to get a little bit of help as she ages. And then we are also building Kelly a, um, a barn inspired studio for her to write her children's books from. Um, we have invited Ward Smith, a local wetland scientist, uh, to the property uh, to do a delineation and, and give us some feedback on whether or not there were any key concerns um, with runoff or anything with the wetlands. Uh, one of the things that we are planning to do is engage a civil engineer um, who is going to review the soils at time of excavation and, um, um, and help us understand what we need to do to control stormwater runoff. Um, we, we didn't want to put a plan together right up front uh, because in conversations with the engineers, it, it seemed to make more sense for them to really look at what the absorption ability was of the, of the soil so we could do exactly what's right. Um, we're hoping we have, a, uh, we're going in front of the Zoning Board of Appeals in November. Um, and if all goes well, we're hoping to break ground on this project um, in December or early spring. Um, and I'm happy to answer some questions, but I, I think that's a, a general overview of what we're looking to do. Is that, there already a property on that lot? Yes, this is a single family property. Um, Kelly lives up in the main house. Uh, it's it's not, small, the main house is not shown on there. It is, but it's very light. Yeah, it's, it's the proposed, it, it's the lighter gray um, showing the current conditions. It's up at the, it's up in the bottom of the plan towards the bike path. Oh, I got you. it's way at the bottom or yep. depending on which way you're looking, okay. Yep, and there's an existing driveway that's shown on there, but that is also extremely light, but it is on there. That's what, that's the next question I had is where's the driveway? I was wondering on how it relates to the 50 foot wetland side. So that's, always, that's the next question I had. So yeah, the house the, way off Baker Street. Yes, yep, the, it's, okay. the house is well off Baker Street. Okay. And the driveway right. goes roughly in line with the, um, the proposed um, strip of uh, wattles to protect the wetlands during construction. Right. Okay, so but uh, why don't we turn it over to Aaron first, and then we'll go for open questions, if that's all right. So, Aaron. Yeah, so um, just before I jump into kind of my uh, comments and the site visit photos, um, Chris had mentioned something, and I just want to make sure that this is really clear during the public hearing, and then also in the conditions, because this is kind of a new piece of information for me. Um, as far as stormwater, Chris, um, any change, and I know you're talking about doing like a field assessment during construction, but you can't just make field changes and incorporate stormwater during construction. Um, any change that you make to the plan that you've submitted to the Conservation Commission, you'll need to come back to us and notify and get approval for. So, um, if you're planning on putting in say a rain garden or a swale or something to that effect, um, just to let you know, if it's in conservation commission jurisdiction, you will have to come back before us to get approval for it. Um, if you're outside of the hundred foot buffer, then um, I think you're less, um, 
it's less of an issue. So okay, so we we were uh, the the civil engineer and the stormwater mitigation um, came up as we were just talking with Maureen Pollock, the the staff planner for the ZBA. Yep. Um, yep. And and we've been we've been digging into this, and it, it it seems that there is no requirement either in the the Amherst bylaws or at the state level for us to do any kind of stormwater mitigation. Um, so we were we were looking to do it anyway, um, but do it after we've really taken a look at um, the things that were recommended by the engineer, like what are the soils, where how how much is going to be needed to make sure that we don't increase water flow into the wetlands. Um, yeah. So I mean, stormwater treatment and <clears throat> and you know infiltration, encouraging infiltration is very much encouraged so I don't think it would be um, a major issue to get it you know reviewed and approved I'm just saying you'll have to have it reviewed and approved because what's going to happen is the order of conditions will be recorded and then you're going to have to come back for a request for certificate of compliance and if there's something on the plan or something on the site that wasn't approved in the original plan then it's going to get flagged at that point and that's not what you want definitely um, bring it to our attention before um, so just as an FYI on that. Okay, but. so I guess my follow up question would be as as we're not as this plan as written doesn't have a proposed stormwater mitigation. Um, does it make sense for us to move forward in, in that light? Um, or is that would the Commission want us to want to issue a approval contingent on providing that at a later date? Well, I, um, I think either either avenue would be fine. Um, just so long as one way or another, um, the commission is made aware of what you're doing. So for and and, okay. and also because I know that you have a hearing with the ZBA on the 12th of November, um, you know if they have any plan changes that they require of you, mm -hmm. um, you'll have to make those changes to the plan and then notify the commission. So there's one of two ways to go. You could do some investigation, wait until the hearing on the 12th, and we could continue your public hearing until November 18th, at which time you could incorporate any additional changes that you want to make to your final plan and just get it approved all in one shot so that you're ready to go. Or you could you know, proceed with hopefully getting an approval this evening and then coming back before the board if you make a minor change to your plan. So it could go either direction. And maybe what we should do is um, go through the rest of the comments, look at the site photos, and then we can kind of evaluate that after we've done some other kind of procedural stuff like public comments and whatnot. Okay, that, that works for me. I'm, I'm, I'm open to which direction we, we go. I just want to do take the right path and make sure that we're we're, we're doing what's required because I know the ZBA will look at what's decided tonight and um, that should have some impact on, on what they want to recommend as the environmental stuff is certainly in your guys purview. Okay. Um, so two things before I turn it back over to you Aaron. So first off if um, they decide to come if we proceed tonight and approve and then they come back with um, modifications. I just want to make it clear to Chris that, you know, that's not a new application. It's just a modification. So it's a lot easier. There's no additional paperwork. And Aaron, I just want to double check that there's no additional fees or anything like that. Oh, unless it was a like, so we have, we can approve minor administrative changes to the plan. Um, it's, it, it's only if it came, you came back with like a major plan change that we would have to reevaluate that. But, you know, that's few and far between. Okay. So I just want to um, make that clear. And then the other piece was, uh, and this is my fault, Chris, um, if you could just introduce yourself, maybe you said it in the beginning, but uh, I missed um, your introduction, who you are and how you're associated with the project. Yeah, absolutely. I, I didn't I didn't introduce myself. So my name is Chris Lee. Um, I'm the head of a company called Backyard ADUs. Uh, and we started uh, helping homeowners build these small detached homes in their backyards, uh, primarily uh, for housing for family, just just like this scenario, um, and I've been overseeing the the de design and development of the projects, uh, and identifying uh, other experts to come in as needed, like Ward Smith and uh, Terry Reynolds, the engineer who may be consulting on this. Okay, excellent. Thank you. That's helpful for background. Um, so, Aaron, the ball's in your court. Okay. 
So DEP did issue a file number on this project um, and there was no comments from DEP on it. So just as an FYI, um, it was just a plain old file number issuance. Um, so that pretty well indicates there's no standout concerns from them. Um, as far as uh, the plan, and, and I'll just kind of go through sort of my recommendations from visiting the site and then I'll show you the site photos, but I would definitely recommend that we include the standard boilerplate state and local special conditions for residential projects as part of this. Um, just sort of standard protection that we would require for any residential building project. Um, one of the things that I had pointed out in the field was, um, so um, the low spot, so the, the driveway is kind of the high spot on this lot and um, it slopes down towards the wetlands um, on the south side of the driveway and then down uh, towards the north, it slopes down as well. And so one of the things I had commented on because of the proximity to the property boundary was that the, um, homeowner or representative may want to incorporate an erosion control along the property line although it's outside of our jurisdiction it's flowing down and i just don't want to see anything migrating off the site so that was more of a recommendation um a stone construction entrance and again um it's kind of dependent on weather conditions but um this last winter and spring we had this freeze thaw cycle that was absolutely horrendous for job sites and um, resulted in a lot of heavy equipment tracking a lot of material onto roadways, which then got into um, catch basins. And it's just it's um, just to make sure that any any equipment coming off of this site is clean, has clean tires or tracks on it. I would recommend. Um, and then also because the driveway turnaround. Um, is actually within 50 feet. So um, because this was a pre-existing driveway that was in place, um, you know, it's closer than 50 feet, which is what our bylaw requires. So I would just recommend that whatever material that little um, turnaround for the driveway um, is used be a partially pervious material that can handle some absorption as opposed to pavement. Um, these are site visit photos. So if you're standing in the driveway looking north is what uh, the view is from the top left. And then if you sort of turn north east um, is the view to the, the bottom left. And then if you turn around um, and face um, west, um, you see the driveway here and then the, the wetland boundary there. And then if you face south, um, the bottom left, you can see that there's a wetland and then there's a home on the other side of the wetland. But I mean, it was, it looked like a um, relatively straightforward residential construction project. I didn't have any major uh, standout concerns based on the site, site visit or review of the plans. Okay, thank you very much, Erin. So commissioners, any thoughts, questions? Brett, is this a type of scenario where um, abutters had to be notified of this sort of construction activity? It is, okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, abutters within 300 feet of the property line were notified and um, they're, so any application that comes before the board, NOI, RDA, ANRAD, they're all required to do that. And um, and uh, they're required to notify certified mail or certificate of mailing. And Chris did provide to me the um, proof of a butter notification. I think, um, I think my sentiment is, you know, uh, you know, I, I sort of defer to, to Brett and others as to whether or not it's better to just to wait to approve it until we see the plans for, for runoff. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll wait to hear what others say. Is, isn't that the wetlands over there, isn't that the stream area that goes down to our 
to the plan we're dealing with on University Drive, like one south? Mm -hmm. um, so Larry, I don't, that it wasn't actually a stream back there. It was just a BVW, um, but this there- isn't, isn't, that, isn't that the same water line or whatever you want to call it that goes down to one University Drive south? Um, so I wouldn't doubt if they were hydrologically connected somehow, mm -hmm. but the, um, I don't believe there was a, an intermittent stream in that wetland. Uh, the intermittent stream you're referring to, I believe flows along the bike path, um, which is a little further oh. west, I believe. But it is very close to that one university though. It is, yeah. yep. Yeah. Just about abuts it. Yeah, I, I, when I, I looked, I went to, I didn't know where Baker Street was, so I went to the town maps and I looked it up and found out where it was. And it looked to me like it was just, that's the upstream of where one university south is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a little, it's a little south, but yeah, it's in the same vicinity. I drive by there all the time, so I notice it, that, you know, what's going on there. I know where that, I've never looked at that house, but I know what the things are in front of it and so forth, though. So Aaron, I wasn't, obviously I haven't been there, um, <clears throat> but when you're there, so now we're going to add two more structures to the property. Are you, are you concerned about runoff from those structures? It looks like so they're going to be on the other side of the driveway. So it's like structures, driveway, and you said the driveway is the high spot? So um, The driveway is the high spot on okay. the, the so property. Yeah. So basically um, everything off the house is going to go to the abutter. Yeah, it's going to it's going to move toward more toward that north side right, of the I property see. as opposed to towards the wetland. Um, it's also a, I'm not sure the exact acreage of the lot, but just the configuration of the lot. It was it seems like a relatively large lot. Um, I'm not sure, Chris, if you know off the top of your head, the the acreage yep. of the lot. Point uh, nine uh, acres and the property line is roughly there's a couple of. Um, I think they're birch trees that kind of show the the division between the the property line goes in the middle of the field roughly when you're there gotcha so i mean it was it's um i mean like a standard lot might be a half acre and this is a an acre so um it's got a small single family on there now and it would have a small barn and a small secondary structure so i mean it didn't it didn't strike me that they were um going to be at, you know covering the site and impervious it's pretty sizable pretty sizable lot but they are adding um some modicum of impervious hopefully semi-pervious uh within the 50 foot that little that little um turnaround yeah, it's small yep <laughs> And that will be gravel. That's not going to be paved. That's going to match the driveway. Okay. But in general, gravel doesn't, isn't all that much less pervious. I, I, I'd have to think through what the right word is. Uh, it doesn't drain, it drains about as poorly as asphalt. Mm -hmm. I mean, gravel. It is as impervious as asphalt. Thank you. It's getting too late. I didn't have dinner yet, so. Oh, jeez. Um, Okay. Yep. So, I mean, so what would even be preferred instead of gravel, uh, in my opinion, would be semi-pervious pavers or something along those lines, because I think that those have a larger, Jen, correct me if I'm, R factor? No, that's for, there's some factor about how much yeah. water going through it. I forget that. R factor is insulation. Yeah, no, and U factor is windows. <laughs> we'll call it D factor for driving. Yeah, good. So, um, Chris, do you have any feelings on that, or do any other board members have other suggestions or gravel? It's not awful. It's not a huge area, but I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that fact about gravel. Um, if if it if we needed to put it on a bed of sand, or I, I mean, I'm just talking. I don't really know how you would make it more pervious, but um, semi pervious pavers would be acceptable too for that space. I think those have. Um, those work well for little car car turnarounds and parking places. Yeah, I think the issue is that gravel 
is compacted to the point where it's impervious, whereas semi-pervious or pervious pavers can resist the compaction that would make them impervious. F okay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. But it sounds like Chris, you're amenable to that. So thank you. So if we can get that um, change, but yeah, we can just do that through order of conditions. Um, yeah. So I'm not hearing any issues and we'll open up to the public in a minute. Um, the big one kind of like Laura was saying was, do we want to do this as sort of one thing tonight? That's the direction I'm leaning. Um, cause maybe they don't have any changes afterwards. And so then they'd still have to come. And if they come with us with changes, it's going to be, yeah, they'll be, they'll probably likely be pretty small. And I think we should just be able to do it very quickly. I don't think it makes a big difference, but does anybody else have feelings one way or the other? Okay, so um, if there's anybody here from the public who has some comments on this project, if you wanna raise your virtual hand. Okay, so I'm not hearing anything and I'm not hearing anything else from the commissioner. So I guess at this point we're looking for a motion. And so Aaron, if you could put back up the conditions and then the additional addition, the additional condition would be changing from gravel to impervious, no, to pervious um, for the small extension drive of the driveway. Thank you. And what about, um, so negative, can you remind us again, Aaron, about negative this and box that? Sorry, my son just came down to say goodnight to me. Um, That's more important. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's just a, it's just a, to issue an order of conditions with uh, special conditions under the state and local boilerplate. And then, um, if you want to add any of those additional recommended conditions that were discussed. Okay. Anybody want to take a stab at it? <laughs> How about so moved? <laughs> All right, I'll try. Okay. Um, I move to approve. Uh, this project is, um, with the conditions that the boilerplate state and local special conditions for residential projects are implemented, um, including additional erosion controls on both the north side, um, which is recommended but not required. Um, also recommend a stone construction entrance to keep the excavated material off the roadway. Um, we also recommend that the additional driveway turnaround be partially pervious um, and uh, move to a more pervious, um, you know, paving solution that's not gravel. Um, any changes um, to be, uh, any, any changes outside of this to be approved by the board? Thank you, Laura. Right. That was my best. That was my best. That was great. Good job. Second. Okay, so looking for a voice vote. So Jen? Aye. Laura? Aye. Larry? Aye. Leroy? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. And I for me as well. So thank you, Chris. Um, Aaron will be in touch with paperwork and just to triple state it. Um, yeah, any changes that happen, um, please get in touch with Aaron and then uh, we'll move it through the system. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. So what's the timing? Our next one is um, 7.35. So we are good there. Uh, bah, 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 bah. So we formally opened this one before, Aaron. So this is a continuation or do we need to formally open? Nope. This is formally opening tonight. Okay. Okay. So let me go through the rigmarole there. 
This public hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protection of wetlands as most recently amended in the Town of Amherst Wetlands Protection Bylaw. This is a notice of intent from BSC Group for Eversource to propose a permanent access road at Podic sub at Podic sub um, substation. And this is parcel 2C or map 2C parcel one. If you are here as a part of that, if you can raise your virtual hand and then we can make you a panelist. And only people who are a part of the application should be a panelist. So if you're here for the from the general public, which is great, uh, we will um, definitely allow you ample time to ask questions. Good evening. Uh, <laughs> Melissa Kaplan's here from the BSC group. Um, I also see uh, Jonathan Roberge from Eversource. He's the senior environmental scientist and Dan Nitschi from GZ is also here to talk about, um, to if he needs to talk about the mitigation at all. Uh, for the other project that our mitigation is providing um, compensation for. Excellent. And so um, Melissa, if you could just introduce yourself real quick, I think you maybe just did, um, <laughs> then provide some background for the project, that'd be great. Sure. Um, Melissa Kaplan, BSC Group, representing Eversource Energy. Um, the project um, involves the uh, construction of a um, 139 linear feet permanent gravel utility road outside the back corner of the Podic substation, um, where we recently permitted the installation of a new utility pole. But this access road is needed to um, uh, help provide safe and uh, stable access to the back corner of the substation to um, uh, to uh, uh, the electrical infrastructure that's back there, as well as to the recently installed pole. Um, the 139 linear feet of road will result in 1,775 square feet of BVW impact, as well as 256 square feet of buffer zone. Um, mitigation for this, for the BVW impacts are being provided across the street at the Podic Coal Sanctuary in the um, agricultural field. Um, we will be creating uh, wetlands as well as a 5,077 square feet vernal pool, we'll call it, amphibian pool, pool that we are attempting to provide for spadefoot toads. Um, it also includes, I think, 605 square feet of wetland impacts um, for um, this portion of the project. In addition, we're also providing um, an additional uh, 1,400 square feet of wetland uh, creation uh, for the um, Fairmont, the Montague to Fairmont Reliability Project um, that was agreed upon for under their order of conditions and as well as ours. Um, we did a site visit there today with um, Brett and Fletcher. Um, and I think we got a good idea of, of what's going on out there. There is a beaver, uh, it's, it's an interesting um, beaver dam. It's like a mud dam. They're not really using sticks. <laughs> so they're kind of creating this channel here that you can kind of see here and then back in underneath the right away and in the woods there they have kind of made a big mud mud dam from these I don't we're not quite sure what they're doing <laughs> slipping and sliding in the mud and then moving the mud back there um, and making and in, it's impounding the area so we're hoping that the removal of the this um, beaver dam and impoundment will help um, create, you know, will help reduce the flooding in this area and create a, a more natural wetland and for us to have a successful um, spadefoot toad pool. Um, we could talk a little bit more about the spadefoot toad pool. Um, it's, um, we 
we did field work and determined that our probably the top of the you know the groundwater is about 18 inches down so we're going to dig down to that 18 inches and then we're going to have it built back up on the edges to allow for 9 to 12 inches of hopefully um, of groundwater filling of that pool in April and May during snow melt and you know the the higher water table times of the year which would then provide habitat for the spadefoot um, toad. We're just going to put down a couple of little logs there to provide a little bit of habitat for the frogs or the toads um, and then um, we have created um, an upland buffer between the wetland line currently and where we're proposing to put this 5,000 plus square foot area um, to plant some upland shrubs to provide some habitat for protection for the um, you know spadefoot toads as was directed by Jake at the um, National Heritage uh, per Aaron provided us that guidance um, and all, all of this was was based on guidance provided by Jake and uh, the pool itself will be seeded with a grass seed mix. Um, we wanted to keep it grasses because we didn't want to put any sort of wetland plants in there obviously that, that wouldn't survive or um, any type of like a conservation seed mix would have more larger flower plant plants like goldenrods and joe pie weed that just might not might I don't know if it would choke it out or just might not be conducive to a vernal pool. So we kept it just seeded with um, grass seed mix and the edges planted with the the farm field edges and some of the other edges planted with a conservation seed mix and then some some upland um, and mixed in with some fac fac wet um, uh, like blueberries things like that on the, the edges uh, towards the wetland side and then um, as I mentioned over as you move to the left or I think that's the west uh, we have about a 605 wet, square foot wetland area that's going to be planted with some shrubs and herbaceous species species and then as you can see that black line over to the left separates the, what we're calling the, the mitigation area b which is the 1400 square feet that's going to be created and planted with um, a variety of shrubs and native um, or uh, grasses, sedges, like Juncus effusus and things like that in there. And then if as a protection measure and to ensure we have hydrology to these wetlands in case that beaver dam successfully stays away, we want to make sure this wetland area stays hyd hydro hydric and stays has hydrology. So we created, we're going to create a little um, channel in the currently um, delineated wetlands to help bring, to help keep that hydrologic connection. But we've created a, a high enough berm, but an upland area between the pool and the wetlands. So um, hopefully this pool will only be groundwater fed. I think that's it. I don't know, Aaron, if you want to you know, add anything else to the, our discussion on on this, but I think that I think that covers it. Yeah, so I mean, and just, you know, I've, I've have tried to really keep the commission sort of informed about this project over the last um, year or so, because the discussions have been going on for quite a while about this. Um, but, you know, some time ago, um, I was in communication with Melissa about um, the, the need to in, um, create the access road for structure access on the Podic substation. And the question became really like they could replicate on site again, which they did for the previous um, order of conditions from last October. But they're, you know, the impact, and I'm talking relative here, but the impact to the wetland is so relatively small that what it ends up being is this basically going in, clearing a bunch of woody established woody vegetation that's native in order to go in and level it and dig out you know a say 600 square foot wetland area next to it to try to replicate on the site with the substation and 
we're sort of trying to think creatively about how you know we could we could do something that would be like um a an interesting sort of partnership that would be a win-win for Eversource and also for the town. And so that's how discussion of this came up. And initially, you know, we've been so challenged by the beavers on Podic because they're basically flooding out the entire property and it makes it really difficult. Our trail system is underwater and, um, they, they, the only solution that we've been, um, told will be effective here is to remove them because the as Melissa referenced the dam that they've created is is basically a linear dam across the field that's made out of sticks and mud and so it's not a typical um, situation where they're blocking out a culvert or something like that where we can just you know put in a, a beaver deceiver it's such a, a linear configuration and they're flooding such a large swath of land that really just removing them is the only way to um, resolve the flooding, which is occurring on the conservation area and is also flooding out the right of way, which runs through the property. So, um, and in conversations with Dave, we thought the spade foot toad fernal pool creation would be a really unique and interesting project to do on a piece of conservation land. We could monitor it, perhaps involve some educational component um, for the public, and um, that it would be more of a benefit as opposed to adding a tiny little wetland over next to the substation. Exactly. <laughs> and so, Aaron, do you, do you want to put back up your pictures for those who did not have the opportunity to be out there? It's really beautiful for those who haven't been out there. It is. Um, so the top photo, um, zoom out a little bit. The top left photo is the impoundment. And actually, can you guys see my cursor? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you can see the right of way. You can see the electric um, pole here and the line running here. The, the impoundment runs basically right along here. And it's a linear impoundment. And it's very large and very long. The first time I went out to see this, which was probably three months ago, much of this area was not underwater. They've, they are exponentially um, making this more and more flooded. Um, and so if, if you're standing at the edge of the wetland, um, like say, say right about where my cursor is and you're looking um, north that's pretty much your view there and i believe this this uh, linear line here is showing the, the beaver impoundment is that right melissa yes okay so then um if you if you back out a little bit um so if i was standing sort of in that general area and looking um west you can see the valley light opera barn and then um, looking um, the top right is facing the mitigation area west. So the, you can still see that right of way line running there. Um, it's just, I kind of backed out a little so you could see the general area where the mitigation and the pool would be constructed. And then this is facing uh, the bottom photos facing north um, along that tree line there. Okay. Anything else, Aaron? Or? Um, so there was a little snafu with the DEP file number, which um, we were able to actually resolve at the end of the day today, which was incredible. Um, but basically, there was they they had the wrong town name apparently, and it was assigned to the wrong <laughs> to the wrong. Um, region. And so um, we were able to resolve it and Mark Stinson got a hold of it tonight. Um, I haven't actually had a chance to even look at the DEP file number comments, um, but I could pull those up if you want while we take okay. other questions. I can I can also summarize them too if you want to. And is there anything from natural heritage on this? So this particular this particular location is outside of natural heritage, um, any natural heritage polygon. 
Um, there is a polygon to the south, there's a polygon to the north, and there's a polygon to the um, west. And I know the polygon to the south is related to the, um, a fern, an endangered fern. Uh, as far as the one to the west, that may actually be spadefoot, but I'm not positive on that. Okay, and another issue that came up in the field today was potential issues with the right of way for um, where the easement is for the right of way. We thought that was clear, but Melissa, do you know if that was cleared, or does Jonathan know if that was? That's um, I'm, I'm. If you when when Aaron's done, if she pulls up the the plan, there's a black box that shows the limits, the complete limits of the entire you know view of the mitigation area. And it looks to be print, the majority, almost all of it is, is well away from the line. The only thing that I just need to double check is the channel that is proposed that might get close to the 25 foot, is a 25 foot, well, it's a 50 foot right away, but it, it's usually 25 feet from the center. So from the pole usually. So if we, measure 25 feet from the pole out, which I, I need to get the pole GPS. Um, and if we find that that channel is right at that 25, then we can always pull that channel back or angle it a little bit differently. But other than that, I don't think anything else is gonna, gonna be in that, be in that area. So I do think that, you know, this, this plan may still need to be tweaked a little bit, just, um, you know, maybe Jake wants to look at it or, or that may that may change um, something a little bit, so I'd be willing to, Aaron, put some sort of you know condition in the in the plan to you know just have uh, some sort of approval by by you and the commission for the final plan, something like that. Um, if you guys are okay with that, I'm not expecting anything major. I do also want to have. Um, a beaver company, you know, just take a look at that beaver dam too and just confirm that we can definitely remove that and trap beavers and all that. I think Aaron, you had mentioned you had talked to them and it said it's not conducive to having a, uh, um, a beaver deceiver. So we know that there is a possibility that the beaver dam and the beavers could come back. Um, but this is, we're putting this mitigation area in, you know, the currently impounded outside of any of the wetland limits. So hopefully it would it would stay that way um, even if the beavers came back because they've been there for a couple of years now. So yeah, and so remove means kill, just to be clear on that. So beavers are not moved somewhere else. So um, and then yeah there's always that issue with beavers that they will come back at some point. I don't so but yeah. Um, that doesn't negate anything that's going on here, but just to point that out. Right. Um, so commissioners or particularly people, well, I was going to say particularly people have been out there, but anybody, anybody have thoughts or comments? I know that Fletcher, you had some thoughts out in the field. Um, yeah, nothing major. I mean, I think this is a good opportunity to do this project. Um, like I said, uh, Melissa, we talked about with the plantings, if you can do something that's bigger to make sure that, um, so we're not dealing with seedlings and stuff like that. So just make yeah. sure when the invasives do come in that at least the stuff you plant has an opportunity to thrive. Um, and then we haven't talked, it, but there's any chance that we can, and maybe this is a town thing, but on the podic side, when you walk in and then it's flooded, when you get to the right of way, there's a clogged culvert. It looks to be an old beaver deceiver maybe in there. Yeah, chance we can get that. <laughs> we're we're uh, Dave and I are definitely keenly aware of the area you're talking about, Fletcher, and it is on our radar majorly. And it is in. So the the goal with that area is once the water recedes from from the beavers, that we'd like to get in there and remove that, yeah. and um, evaluate at that point putting in either a raised boardwalk situation just to you know elevate the trail and keep people out of that area altogether or to put in a bridge but that could really only be determined once the beavers are out because right now it's it's so the whole area is so underwater that um mm -hmm. it's difficult to kind of assess you know any way of resolving that right okay that's yeah no problem um 
And then the other thing we talked to uh, Melissa and Jonathan about was um, when we do, uh, when um, this fernal pool gets created, I think this would be a really wonderful opportunity to talk about why we're doing it. So signage. I mean, I don't know if we can say like, hey, there's a rare something in here, but you know, why, why do we do this? You know, and clearly what we're going to get into the next agenda item is that there's going to be additional trails being in there. So I have a feeling this place is going to get a lot more use out of it. So I think some type of signage would be kind of cool. I totally agree with you, Fletcher. And um, that's definitely something that's on my radar screen as well. And um, to, to your point, um, one of the things that I've been sort of negotiating with Eversource because of the the Fairmont to Montague um, structure line replacement project and their their tree removal and their wetlands impacts and their riverfront impacts, which are extensive, but we also and I, and I think this may have been you might have missed it because it it may have been reviewed when you um, you missed a meeting or two, but. Um, We'll go over that in more detail this evening, but one of the things is an account that basically will provide us with substantial funds that we can use to, for any type of mitigation, education, tree removal, tree planting, you know, so that we can address wetlands issues on our lands, on the conservation lands in town responsibly. Um, and uh, so that I think would be something that would be really excellent to incorporate. I agree. And I know UMass already, because I, <laughs> I took a class at UMass and we were out on Podic doing wetland delineation. I know they yeah. use that property for educational purposes already. So it'd be really cool to not number one, to incorporate the replication area as a study, but also if we could ever, if there was ever a need to transplant spadefoot toads, if we could really, you know, create an environment that was um, hospitable to them, it would be really cool to be able to take a look at that. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Aaron, we talked to Fletcher about how we, um, I'm sorry. I'm calling you by your last name. I apologize. No, Fletcher, no, no. Fletcher, 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 oh, okay. Fletcher's the first name. Oh, okay. All right. Good. <laughs> You're right on. Sorry about that. No problem. Um, uh, and we talked about that, you know, BSC and Eversource would you know, be happy to help with that and have, you know, I'm sure Eversource would love to have their, you know, name and be a part of that and, 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 and recognize that they contributed to this as well as BSC. So Aaron, we'd be happy to help with that, um, put something together, um, you know. Yeah, that'd um, be cool. I do, I do, um, well, let's talk about, let's talk about these comments and then I want to go back to um, the beaver if well let's talk about that now since we're kind of on it and these questions had to do with the the the, the road more than the mitigation site but um you know we still like i mentioned we still i still want to confirm ever, uh, you know that with with the beavers and i know you've had some conversations did you did you have a conversation that they can definitely remove you know that dam or um is that something they yeah, so I, I was in touch with Beaver Solutions, mm -hmm. and my goal was to create a beaver deceiver, you know, okay. something that would allow the water to drain but not require the removal of the beavers. And that was really my my goal in reaching out to them and trying to get them to, you know, come up with something. And they came out and looked at it, and they said that this site is just really not a candidate. It would not be successful. They, they had recommended um, another company to do um, the trapping um okay and uh so i mean i could certainly we could come back to that i they sort of knew that this was on the radar screen for the town but we just didn't have the resources um yeah to so do I, I mean I, I just i think i think if it's because it's just a bunch of mud you know it could simply just be shovels and getting getting it out of there um but I, I want to also just make sure that if we do need to tweak something in terms of that, um, it's okay to do it under either an amendment or a, a, a field change or something in terms of that. And that we sh we're okay closing the hearing because I don't necessarily have a straight answer on the dam removal. The dam removal. Yeah. yeah. So I, I've dealt with this quite a bit. Um, on, on some other projects and um, 
I think as long as the commission approves that the the dam be incrementally dismantled, that we should be in good shape once the you know once the beavers are removed. And that's something that I mean, I you know we can discuss. But like um, I know um, the guys who are, do our land management had expressed early on, like, hey, would it be okay if we take this down? Because they're just not sh you know they're not necessarily aware of the. Um, regulatory or yeah. legal consequences or something like that. So I let them know, like, definitely don't do that. But once yeah. it's incorporated in the order of conditions, it's something that, um, and we would definitely want to be very cautious and very careful about drawing this down in an incremental, very slow manner, because there's so right. much water behind it. Um, I think the trapping of the beavers is really going to be the, um, yeah. the key component to getting this issue resolved. Okay, and we can work with you on the company. I know Eversource has another company they use as well. Jonathan and I talked about. Um, so, okay, good. I, I, it sounds like you're pretty confident. And I, I feel like this can be removed as well. So I didn't want it to hold anything up, but I just wanted to just make that point. Um, hey, Brett, could I make a quick comment before we leave the beaver? Please. Um, so yeah, I've been listening uh, intently. I guess I just wanted to make it clear, particularly to the new commission members, you know, it, it strikes me as we're having these conversations that um, anytime we're talking about beaver removal, which as Brett pointed out is, is really the beavers are destroyed. They can't be relocated, they can't be moved. Um, you know, I have never taken such recommendations lightly when, when we bring them to the commission in large part because fundamentally you say, well, um, so if beavers can't do their thing on conservation land, where can they do them? Where, where can they do their thing, right? So um, I guess the bottom line, you know, I wanted to express is that um, we, in my time with, with, with the commission and with the department, with the town, we've only done this, I, I would say a handful of times. And in this case, um, really a couple of things are in play. One is, you know, I have great concern about um, the electrical service, the, 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 uh, the, the line that is being impacted by the beaver flooding. Um, if, if, if you've never seen kind of a before and after when beavers do their thing, which is wonderful and great for habitat, um, but they move a tremendous amount of earth, uh, mud, water, and when they move on or when they're trapped or when they die, it is pretty dramatic what, what, is, what comes after. And so I am first and foremost, very concerned about, about the infrastructure there that crosses Bodick and Catherine Cole. Secondly, um, Fletcher pointed out the trail to Podick. Really, there's, there's no easy way to get to the Podick conservation area right now. So you really need to walk through a lake to get there. So our trail is com completely impassable from the east. If you want to go through, excuse me, I'm talking about Podick. The Podick trail is completely impassable. If you want to get to Podick, you need to go all the way through Catherine Cole and go around all the way to the far west and come back through. So, um, and I, I really strongly su suspect that when the water recedes after we breach the dams, um, we're probably going to have to rebuild that trail and the culvert that Fletcher, you, um, that stream crossing that Fletcher, you referenced earlier. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of work when the water recedes to reestablish that trail. So I just wanted to emphasize that we don't take any recommendation to trap beavers lightly or, you know, it, it comes with, I think, a lot of responsibility and a lot of forethought. Um, we have beavers all over on conservation land and they do their thing and they're great for habitat and wildlife uh, in general and we enjoy them but this is a situation where I think they're now flooding many many acres of land and and impacting the infrastructure as well as the trails so I just wanted to add that. Thank you. David. I get the I get the impression that since I've joined the commission that we have more problems with beavers than we do with people. <laughs> Does anybody know how be how many beavers there are in Amherst? No. I mean, are we talking about a hundred? Fifty? 
20 is it, no, Harry, it's not a number that's captured in the census. Well, just like they don't keep track of bears in town, as we know. But, you know, that's in some cases, they don't want to know how many. They don't want people to know how many are here. But I often wonder about those things. Give Harvey Allen a call. He probably has the number for you. Yeah, right. With the amount of wetlands we could ha we have, we could support hundreds of mating pairs of beavers easily. Yeah, I don't I don't disagree. I mean, <laughs> just to give you a ballpark. It is funny about this the commission having to deal with beavers more than many other things. Anyway. Yeah, it's actually a, a big thing across the whole country, Larry. It's not just here. Beavers are a major issue in lots of places. Well, yeah, except I go back to the thing as, as uh, uh, I'm going to pass that, but the idea that, that this used to be called the, uh, the Hadley wetlands, the Hadley swamp, and so the forth. Swamp. I mean, you'd expect it to be here. I mean, you'd, you'd expect that to be the case, but it, it is interesting. <laughs> okay, anyway. so, um, so we definitely have to deal with the comments, but I think the comments are more about Podic. So yeah. why don't we concentrate to start off with, um, with the new created wetland. And so do people have questions or comments on that one? I have, I have two for you, Melissa. So first I think, so the grasses that you're gonna be planting, I assume those are all native grasses? Oh yes, definitely. Okay, the I Jack thought so, I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, yeah. Um, my I other question is, is related to building or construction. So I assume that there's gonna be heavy equipment that's used and yeah. I assume that they're going to go in that road that comes off of 116. Yes. And so making sure that they do it the right time of year when that road is not flooded, like if they went in now, they would just destroy that road. Uh, has there been some thought to that? Um, I know Erin and I talked about that, you know, she kind of wants the mitigation to be created as soon as possible. So we were talking about spring, but maybe we do need to wait until it's dry. Um, I mean, this time of year is usually pretty dry, but you know, we've been in a drought, but we had a bunch of rain. So that's why it was so kind of muddy and wet in there. But I, I think if we do it in the dry season, I think that would that would be good. Um, it's, I mean, ultimately, if that's what you guys want, we can definitely do that. But we would definitely come in that road using the upland, upland access and then cut across the field using the uh, access. Um, that is something that Jonathan and I talked about was that we did not actually show the access and we can absolutely, as part of the updates to the plan, show that. I think we probably would 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 probably want to use matting because we wouldn't want to mess up your, you know, the fields with the equipment other than the areas that we're supposed to be impacting. So we should probably document that on the plan as well. Um, so that is something that we could we could add. And yeah, I mean, um, that'd be a lot of matting to go all the way in from the road. So that's well, just we in the wetland areas, though, I think would make sense because there is a, a wetland that is, I think, possibly partially crossed by that road. Uh, also, that road, though, Aaron, I mean, it, it was <laughs> super wet right now. Yeah, it's yeah, it's I, I've been out there. I was out there this summer and um, there was definitely still a wet, low, you know, a wet low spot um, closer to the Valley Light Opera Barn. Yeah. But once you get further west it was hot it was higher and drier but this time of year i agree with you i was out there this morning too and <laughs> i was sloshing in my muck boots um i was yeah. just gonna just gonna comment to melissa that that barn is owned by the valley light opera and so we want to just make sure that if we're like number if we can avoid crossing their property i think that would be good if it can't be avoided then we should try to seek out um maybe permission from them to access back there but uh, okay. that might be more of a question for for Dave um Dave Zomek and I think matting would be the best way to do it honestly that's the only way to do it yeah it's a I lot of mats it's a lot of mats look what they're using to put to put in the uh, power poles I mean mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, the other thing we could do is we could definitely mat in from the beginning, you know, where we're crossing the barn and, and it does look like, yeah, you're right, we do cross a little bit of the wetland. And then once we get into the upland access road, you know, we can stop using it and then we can always restore um, or we just, we just mat. I, you know, I can, I can talk to Jonathan and, and see what he thinks and have maybe someone go check it out and see if it's possible to, to do this without you know, damaging that area. And to, to your point, Melissa, I think it would make a whole lot of sense to include 
a DEP file number sign in both locations, not just at the substation site yeah. for that work, but also a DEP file number sign for the town property and possibly even a sign with like a little explanation that this work is wetland mitigation restoration work that's being done um, in partnership with the town, just so that people because people will see heavy mach machinery back there on town land and and wonder what's going on and it will be an opportunity to educate people and um so i think that might be a good thing to include okay okay anything else on the vernal pool and the toad pool so okay so um i don't think i've had a chance to look at the comments i don't know if Aaron, you want to summarize them or if you want Melissa to summarize those? So I'll just jump in the one. I, um, so the, the, for the first one is the conflict with the work that was the previous um, file number. And Melissa, so correct me if I'm wrong, but the work was completed um, that was associated with that previous order of conditions. And there is a replication area which was created on the north side already, the north side of the substation as part of that. And I believe we're just in the monitoring phase right now of the replication area. And other than that, I don't think there's really any work associated with that that's going on. Yeah, I mean, I, I took a look at the yeah. mitigation area. I can send you photos, it's pretty successful and I think it's pretty complete. When I I was going to work on getting that closed out because I think it's, because I think it's, it looks great. Somebody's echoing. Yeah. Um, that's okay. <laughs> um, um, it might be a good idea for people who aren't talking to mute. I don't know if somebody's got two mics on. All right, we'll see if that helps. Um, the other, the other um, one that really jumped out at me, Melissa, which yeah. I actually agree with um, in Mark's comments here are the, um, the issue yeah. with basically cutting off the hydro, hydrologic connection between yeah. the wetlands. And so I definitely think that it makes a lot of sense to incorporate some kind of connections in the access road that you're creating. So. A, yeah, you know. I have a, a suggestion on that too. Yeah, I totally, yeah, I didn't even, I don't know why I didn't even think about that. But yeah, I mean, there is a little, I don't know if you want to pull it up on my, my ER map, the ER map, but um, there's a little square right at the substation fence um, that, yeah, that um, we would essentially cut off. Now, what we've done before with something like this with, with access roads is you could put a larger stone under the ground to create kind of a, fo a ford where the water can move, still have a hydrologic connection between the rocks. And I think in this situation, because he suggested a culverts, and I just think it's such a, to, to put culverts by, it's, I mean, it, it's such a dry area. It's not like it's like a very wet area. And, and to put a culvert right by the substation where it could potentially add, I don't know, impact the substation not saying that it would it just it doesn't seem to be uh the best th the best thing you mean so, if it became blocked or something or crushed or something to that effect that it could yeah yeah pool water yeah i could pull water yeah it could it could cause flooding in the substation um so my thoughts are and, and we've done it before and, and i can get a design to you too you know as another condition of the permit is that um we can create like a you, you use a larger stone underneath and then you tap it, top it with a smaller stone. So the water would flow through the rocks underneath and um, still be able to provide that hydrologic connection. Now, Melissa, how frequently would this access road be being used and what type of vehicles would be driving on it? Um, that's a good question. I don't know, Jonathan, if you wanna to speak to that, but I think it's, it's not something that's gonna be used all the time. Um, I think there's a project that might be coming up where they need to get back to the back of the substation. It's going to be used for any emergencies um, or future maintenance. Um, it's it's one of those things that it's just difficult to get back in the in the back by back here, and you have to, go, to be able to, as you can see on the aerial, there's infrastructure everywhere, and to get back there is is difficult. So they want this back access with a gate 
gates in the back so they can get to the back uh, infrastructure there. Um, but it's it's mainly for 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 emergencies. Yeah, and and just to point out because it's not clear really on on here, um, sort of where my cursor is. Um, there's a huge huge transmission line that comes in in that that back area and that's actually the Montague to Fairmont line comes into the substation through there so it's not really shown as right of way on here but it in yeah. the on the um, east side excuse me the east side of that substation the sub the um, transmission line comes into the sub yeah. Melissa um, according to this map that gravel road is actually not on Eversource land whose land is that Correct. It's on, um, I think it's on Mr. Um, uh, uh, I forget his Dollar. name. Yes, thank you. Um, no. But, but the, they are, they have, this will be an easement. They have been working on easements. They, I think they already have one because we had to get one to put the bowl here. So there is um, an easement. Technically they don't own it, but there is, I've seen the documentation that there is an easement here. Okay. Okay. Are there other pieces of the DEP comments, Aaron, that we should go over? Um, so this issue with the fee. Um, yeah. The fee that I selected was just a project that doesn't fit into the other categories because I didn't know if this would be considered a commercial or industrial road. Um, yeah, some of the sometimes uh, determining the correct fee can be a little tricky because it's there's not always a an exact category that fits the project to a T. Um, so that's something that we can kind of work out behind yeah. the scenes, I think. Um, so I just I don't want to take the commission's time with that, but Melissa and I can touch base on that to make sure that we're addressing that properly. Um, So that you know, the next one is for way. number three, like so, the, and I run into this. I run into this quite a bit. Is um, basically to determine that that the project is a limited project. Basically, would be to say that there's no other alternative to the work, and that it it has to that this um, this work has to happen. Um, there's there's no other feasible alternative to this hap to this work taking place and um, that's basically what mark is getting at and and the the um, limited projects are reserved for when a project cannot be redesigned to avoid the wetland and <clears throat> I can't speak for eversource and I certainly don't want to but I can say that if they didn't if they could avoid filling that wetland and spending all this time and expense doing a replication area, they probably would. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I typically consider utility projects if we can't um, come up with an alternative to avoid an area that, you know, that they be given limited project status because they're providing, uh, you know, service to the community but i that's really the commission's discretion to determine if it's a limited project and if if it can be avoided mitigated in any way the work that's being proposed okay, unless they're going to put in some sort of hovering bridge i don't doesn't seem like it yeah, yeah. So. it wouldn't really be safe for equipment to be able to really do that <laughs> Okay. So, and then, um, yeah, so I'm not quite sure how we have to proceed, but yeah, I don't Should think- Should we, I mean, I mean, it, if you feel like we need to continue for some of the stuff, I think um, Eversource is fine with that um, in terms of if we need to reach out to the opera um, uh, barn, I'm sorry, the opera, uh, the people who own the barn property and get you some more of this information it's fine if you feel like we could move forward with that and get you the information you know as conditions or working with you guys to ensure we get you something final i'm in coming back and even presenting that to you I'm, uh, whatever you guys feel is is good for that as well okay 
feels like there's still a bunch of, it's nothing huge, but there's a bunch of enough little things that it seems like a continuation from my perspective would be okay. cleaner. Yeah, okay. I agree. And I also think that with considering the mitigation area is associated with Montague Fairmont, which we left very open-ended, I think on this one, we should really nail it down with a final plan that's as close as we can get it. Okay. Um, Brett, could I just add, um, at this point, I don't think there's any, I would prefer that we not reach out to the Valley Light Opera folks. I mean, I'm talking with them about regrading the road, parking for Bodick and Catherine Cole. So I, I think whatever is decided, I, I think we can, I think um, gaining access over their property is not going to be an issue, but I, I just don't want to complicate matters with them at this point. So I think we can just, I'm happy to work on that when when the time is right. Um, so I think we can save that step for spring, spring, early summer of 21. Okay, sounds good. And so Aaron, did you have any additional thoughts on timing? I heard Melissa's comments, but I'd love, love to hear what you have to say on that. Yeah, so my only comment on timing as far as creation of the wetland is that this is in an ideal situation, in an ideal world, what you would want to do is create the replication area before the wetland impacts take place um, and to make sure that it's adequately established before the work to dest essentially destroy the wetland that's being replicated. So that would be my only real, um, you know, request here. But um, I think, you know, it's weather has been such an incredible wild card that I don't think that we should really nail down and say we should do it at this time or that time. I think what we should do is try to keep an eye on the weather patterns and see what's going on and try to do it at the most responsible time and put the most mitigation measures in place that we possibly can during construction. Um, because, you know, we could have a really dry spring. Um, we could have a, a really dry summer, you know, it's it, and, and to to get us locked into something and then um, have our hands tied if we have an opportunity, I think would be unfortunate, so. Um, yeah, and the, I'm sorry, I just cut you off. Nope. I was gonna say, the other challenge is too is when they need that road built. Um, uh, they may need that road built before the spring. That's the only thing. So if they may have to do that road before we get the mitigation done. Yeah, I wouldn't want to hold that up. I mean, because that has potential, all sorts of potential bad issues if that doesn't go in. So uh, I appreciate what Erin is saying. And I agree. Um, she used the word ideal. And I'll just stress yeah. that one too. Yeah, uh, yeah we got to do what we got to do. And yeah. Okay. Okay, so any other comments? Um, so from the commission, I'll open up to the two people from the public as well. So if you're from the public and if you have comments, uh, you can raise your virtual hand. Okay, so I'm not seeing any there. Any other commissioners have anything? Yeah, so say it again, what we're talking about for um, uh, the reasons for continuation. So I have um, to nail down the access location where access yeah. is going to be placed. And then if there's any matting that's going to be put in place where that matting is going to be located. And then also um, a plan for incorporating a hydrologic connection in the um, <clears throat> access road on the substation site to just to address the DEP comment. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. So that wasn't in the plan, right? Okay. Yep. I understand. Okay. Oh, Larry, you're on mute. <laughs> will, will this substantially hold up the project? Delaying I don't, it? I don't think so. I, I think if we could, you know, let's see, it's what's the date today? If we could, when is your next? Um... We only have one meeting in November and it's on November 18th. Okay. We should, we should, if we can try to aim for that, I think, I think that would work. It seems like pretty small stuff, so I don't see anything yeah. hanging up. Yeah, so. we'll get you a, a, you know, a typical kind of drawing for the road, and then um, we'll work out what we think would be best about the access. 
Okay. Does anybody else have any questions or Melissa or anybody else from the applicant have any? No. <laughs> okay, so I guess we are looking for a motion for continuation to the 18th of November. Do you have a time for us, Aaron? 7.40 p.m. So moved. Second. Okay, looking for a voice vote. So Fletcher? Aye. Larry? Aye. Jen? Aye. Leroy? Aye. Laura? Aye. And I for me as well. So Melissa, we'll see you on the 18th and Jonathan and Daniel, <coughs> we'll see you as well. All right, so thank you thank very, you very much. much. Yeah, you Thanks. guys have a good night. You as Bye. well. Okay, um, so for the next one, are we proceeding with that one tonight, Erin? Um, so we, uh, um, I'll just give a really a quick, um, a quick update on that and then, um, I just, oops, zoomed in too far here. Um, so there was a couple procedural issues um, with with the um, Podic Trail project um, that were, well, the first is basically that the, um, the abutters weren't properly notified. Um, and so I recommend that we don't take any testimony on that hearing um, until all the butters are notified um, and that uh, legal notice or the, the a butter notice rather um, was going out today for the um, November 18th meeting at 7.35. So yeah. the applicant's representative did submit a request to continue. Um, we did receive um, just as a, sort of side note, we did receive extensive DEP file number comments and I have been working with Dave and the applicant to address those comments so that we can come back on the 18th with um, a, a plan to address all of the comments and, um, you know, in a, in a responsible manner to the best of our ability. Okay. Excellent. So that sounds good. Um, and just a sort of a point of reference on this one. So this one was opened, I believe. And so, um, so I guess this only applies to you, Fletcher. If you wanted to be able to vote on this one next time, you'd have the joy of going back and listening to the recording or something like that. But um, yeah, everything's on YouTube, right? They are. And also, um, what I recommended to the applicant is that when they come back on the 18th, that we basically, even though the hearing was opened and it was a posted legal advertisement, that they essentially start back from scratch with the presentation, okay. just to make sure that if any abutters are tuning in, that they have the opportunity to get the full presentation. So whether Fletcher watches that one or not, I'm not sure, you know, he'll probably get a full picture regardless at the, at the um, meeting on the 18th. So if you're sounds looking much, for sounds much better go for it, but if not, <laughs> it sounds like you're good. Yeah. So that, yeah. Cause they've been working out there. Like trails have been rerouted. There's like, there's a lot of work that's already been done out there. On Podic? Yeah. New blazes, new trail. Yeah. Um. Oh, maybe in the upland areas, Fletcher. I'm yeah, not sure. Upland. Yeah. 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 Mostly yeah. upland. Yeah. Yeah. And it yeah. crosses a field to um, Catherine Cole. Yeah. Okay. So does anybody have any questions on this or does anybody from the public have any comments on this one? So, you know, we're gonna be continuing this. Okay, so looking for a motion for a continuation until November 18th and- I think somebody raised their hand, uh, Brett, Amali in the um, uh, audience. Hand one, hand one, oh, goes up and it goes down, okay. So uh, Molly, uh, you should be able to talk at this point. Hello, it's Pete Westover. Oh, hello, Molly, Pete. Yeah, I've been here for a couple hours. Uh, it's not Molly, she's my colleague, but I just wanted to, to comment on the, the, the idea that trail work has been going on. I don't know anything about that and I'd be surprised. Um, he might be talking about the the guys from the conservation department doing um because there was some hazard trees out there and they there may have been trail blazes that were um fixed but i don't know i 
I don't I'll, know I'll, for I'll certain. What I saw was um, there's a, a new trail that got blazed through the field in between Catherine Cole and Podick on the west, furthest west side. And then there's new blazes that went from red to yellow. Are those on the Amherst side, Fletcher, or on the Hadley side? Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, probably the Hadley side, actually. It's on the furthest west point. Yeah, where I think you are talking about the Hadley side. Yeah, so I must be talking about the Hadley side. Yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't think about that. Yeah. That's all. So that's all. That's what I noticed. Thank you. So, Pete, while you're on, do you have anything else you wanted to add? No, no, uh, th that's that's fine. And uh, I, I just wanted to mention that the additional abutters to be notified are almost all uh, east of 116, and they are definitely all more than a third of a mile away. So uh, we'll we'll cover that. I'll get that out tomorrow. And uh, we did have a, I had a, uh, I thought it was a good meeting with Aaron and Dave about the uh, delineating. I mean, it is, uh, I know you don't want discussion tonight, but I think it's, it strikes me as overkill because we were stating, stipulating that the area is entirely BBW, but uh, that will make the EP happy and we'll get the delineating done and then uh, be ready to uh, better make the case for the project. Sounds good. Thank you, Pete. Okay, thanks, Brett. Yep, uh, glad you're able to join us and sorry you had to hang on so long. Oh yeah, no problem. Um, so any other comments before we look for continuation? No, we're good, Aaron? Yes. Okay, do we have a time for the 18th, 7.45 or? 7.35 on uh, November 18th. Looking for a motion. Yeah, I move to make uh, continue the uh, NOI for the proposed bog bridging to 7.35 on November 18th. I second that. Thank you. Looking for a second? Second. I second that. Thank you, Laura. Okay, voice vote. Fletcher? Aye. Laura? Aye. Larry? Uh-oh. Larry looks frozen. Oh, no. Sorry about that. Aye. <laughs> Jen? Aye. And Leroy? Aye. And aye from me as well. So, Pete, we will see you then. Good. Thank you very much. Hey, guys, I have to sign off for tonight. So. Bye, Jen. Bye, Bye, -bye. everyone. Thank you. Bye. Enjoy. Bye. Be safe. Okay, so uh, that's the last one of our official agenda items, but Aaron, I'm sure you have more for us. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, I'm going to try to go through this as quick as we can. Um, so I think the first one that we should, so that there's two Eversource items. Do we still have uh, somebody on from Eversource right now? In our... Yeah, we have two people still. Okay, on. Jonathan, so, okay. So um, one thing, and I think we should get this addressed right off the bat because we were just talking about um, the Montague to Fairmont project and how their mitigation is tied into um, the the work on the um, Podic substation and the, the Zala um, property. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll I'll just say like let's let's just talk about this now and get it get it over with. Um, and there, the contacts are here. So, um. okay. so doo -doo 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 -doo. okay. So, uh, Dan and Jonathan, you should be able to speak when you so desire. Great. Thanks very much. This is Dan Nitchie representing Eversource. Uh, as you just mentioned, Jonathan Robert is on the line. Uh, Steve Lecco from the GZA is also listening in. I don't know if he's identified um, as a participant or a panel met panelist under this. So um, we got our order conditions or received our order conditions from the commission uh, about a month and a half or so ago. Uh, that's been recorded. And uh, some information came to light uh, from the tree clearing uh, crew or the tree evaluation crew, Lewis Tree, 
uh, after our uh, after the closing of the hearing, um, we had it down as a 35 foot uh, study area. And through some evaluations through Eversource, they discovered that they actually needed a 50 foot area um, evaluated. And so the additional 15 feet was added, uh, was, was uh, evaluated and came up with a number after the order was issued. And so it almost triples the amount of tree clearing in Riverfront and BVW. Uh, we've su supplied the commission, or specifically Aaron, with a document outlining the items of the order conditions that have already been approved, including telephone poles over Amethyst Brook with signage, uh, fencing, things of that nature. Uh, we also had a requirement under the order conditions for the 1400 square foot wetland replication area, which as you heard this evening is part of the PODIC project at this point. Uh, it made the most sense to just add on a 1400 square foot to their larger 5,000 square foot plus or minus uh, wetland system that they were creating. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, so we believe that we are satisfying that requirement of the uh, order of conditions uh, by providing a, a design and uh, hopefully at your 18th meeting, you'll approve that order of conditions that would include that 1400 square feet. So the, what's remaining really is the additional uh, mitigation slash compensation for the additional tree clearing that we've discovered. We've used the math uh, equation that was uh, used on the previous order conditions. And so an additional $21,000 is going to be made available to the uh, Amherst Conservation Commission for ecological projects. As Me Aaron mentioned earlier, we're not specifically earmarking the money for one kind of project. It's whatever you folks think is, thinks is appropriate within your community that generally has an ecological improvement component. Uh, we're ever source is satisfied with, with that type of usage of their dollars. Uh, so what we're looking at for a grand total really is a $36,000 contribution um, for, for ecological projects within the community because of the additional, well, because of the tree clearing at all, uh, we now have a grand total. Thank you, Aaron, for bringing up that table. So that sort of arranges what was in the original order and then what's being essentially proposed now uh, as a as sort of a revision or administrative change to the order of conditions. And I'll leave that to you, Aaron. Unless Jonathan, you if you had anything you wanted to add. No, thank you, Dan. That sums it up perfectly. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say um, that I met with Eversource on multiple occasions to talk about this and to review sort of the best approach um, versus like taking a project specific approach that Eversource could take on to address. Um, you know, the tree removal in a mitigation form. And, um, and also, you know, my concern was, because in the, in the approved order of conditions, we had um, made a, we had come up with this um, equation for replacement of 200 trees removed, which ended up being about $15,000. Um, and so my concern was if we almost triple that, we're going to be telling the guys in the, <laughs> in the, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, uh, our field crew, hey, you're going to have to plant like 600 trees as mitigation. And and I just feels like that's not the greatest, you know, we've got so many projects, like we were just talking about on Podic, how we have a clogged culvert. And, you know, we're going to have to address that. Like there's so many things like that, that we have on conservation lands. And, and that $36,000 could be really well utilized on conservation lands throughout town to address things that we don't otherwise have a account to cover and ordinarily our hands are tied to address. And so um, ultimately we decided that just providing financial, a financial um, amount to the commission so that we could decide what we wanted to do in terms of future mitigation projects as compensation for this would be the most logical thing. And so that's um, what we agreed on and what I suggested that they come up with as a proposal. That all sounds, um, yeah, that all sounds great, Aaron. Um, so one sort of comment for me just to the internally is there's a bunch of pots of money right now sitting around for um, trail work and that sort of stuff. And I'm not quite sure if we have the capacity to do all of it internally. And so, you know, maybe the town should think about um, contracting some of that out or something. I don't know if you or Dave have thought about that, Aaron. 
Absolutely. Um, and, and I mean, I think, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting because, you know, with a lot of the trail projects, it's like how to, how to get it done without putting the cart before the horse, you know? Um, and like an example is the Amethyst Brook bridge, bridge replacement, right? Um, Mm -hmm. because the permitting is done and the one thing is the financial ability for us to purchase poles. So when this project came along, it was like, okay, that's the next logical step, get the poles, and then we can get the bridge in. And it's like getting those steps in. And so sometimes that's the one holdup. And it might be something like getting somebody out to delineate wetlands. You know, um, it might be, you know, um, getting somebody out to delineate a stream. It might be, you know, hiring somebody to go through the permitting process for us. And I think that the benefit of this is that it's going to be open-ended in the sense that we can make the decision how we can use the dollars to most efficiently get this stuff done. And I think that it will tremendously help us to do that because a lot of times it's the things like delineating that really are the problem with us getting, getting a, um, a permit submitted because we, Mm -hmm. we can't get out there and like, I can't go out and delineate the wetland and then sit on both sides of the table. So it's like, um, it it would just give us a little bit of a, a boost to get some of those things done. Great. Okay. Um, so this is an amendment that we're talking about. So, uh, I don't know if there's anybody else from Eversource has anything they want to add or, um, if there's any commissioners who have any comments or questions, and um, Stephen, I'll promote you to panelists as well. So if you have anything you want to add. So, I mean, it seems fairly straightforward. I mean, you know, so there's just the additional trees that got taken. The equation still makes sense to me. Um, and yeah, having it be more uh, flexible uh, is great. Okay, so if I'm not hearing anything, then we'll be looking for a motion to approve the amendment. And I would recommend that we approve it as a minor amendment to the order of conditions. And this is the DEP file number here. So I just make a motion to approve the amendments. Minor amendments. My, minor amendments to the order conditions. For DEP file number 0890675. Thank you, can read that. Thank you. Second. Okay, so looking for a voice vote, Larry? Aye. Fletcher? Aye. Laura? Aye. Uh, Leroy? Aye. And Jen fell off. Uh, and then I for me as well. So I think we're good on this one. So is there Thank another you know, source issue it. that we get to address, Aaron? Um, that's it for this one. So okay. our folks who are attending don't feel like you need to stay on, but thank you guys for being on. Um, thank you for coming and you're more than welcome to stay, but one power to you. Um, so the other one, and this is, this is quite a bit even more simple than the last, is um, that on the, at the last meeting, the commission had approved, it was a, so we had approved a, an emergency certification for work to repair a compromised cable on Route 116. And then they, I had required them to file an after the fact request for determination, which they did. Um, and in the course of the um, field work getting started out there, they realized that there was two trees that need to be removed um, on Route 116 that are going to interfere with the, um, the cable repair. Um, and so let me just make sure I've showing you where the plan is that shows where they're located. Um, That's unfortunate, but I assume it's inevitable or unavoidable, I should say. It is unavoidable um, because it runs basically, well, it's going to end up killing the trees and the trees are right on the um, the road right of way. And mm-hmm. so then it's going to make the trees unsafe. So um, yep. so it, they're just basically looking for the board to approve the removal of those two trees. Um, 
because they weren't that wasn't noted in the original determination. And so are we asking them to replant those somewhere? I mean, you know, we absolutely could. Mm -hmm. so. But also, are we making a motion? What are we? On this? Yeah, I would make okay. a motion. Yep. And so, Brett, are you saying replant on 116 or replant on the new Salsa property that we acquired? Yeah, or providing funding to do it. Now we have a nice little equation. It makes it fairly easy. Ah, good call. I like that. So. <laughs> This is uh, Alan Snow. It could take a couple more trees. That's what I'm thinking. Kind of put it under his um, discretion. Would that work, Aaron? Um, yeah, I mean, we could use the the equation that we were just talking about, which is um, the equation that I had come up with for the mitigation. Um, and it was 75. Yeah, 70 five dollars per tree. So you know the commission could um, request seventy-five dollars per tree removed. Yep. And I to like be it. Used for planting elsewhere in Amherst. Or whatever, yeah, whatever he called the ecological intentions that the town has. Yeah, these are street trees. Um, I don't know. So for some reason I'd be more inclined to, you know, replant street trees somewhere, but Sure. Yeah, I think that's totally legit. We've lost a lot of street trees re recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, okay, so can I make a motion to Eversource for the to approve the second mm -hmm. tree removal, but therefore will ask that they provide us the monetary equivalent of those two trees removed, does that work? Yep, for a, which is whatever Aaron's equation of seventy-five dollars per tree. Perfect. Second. Okay, voice vote. Fletcher. Aye. Larry. Aye. Laura. Aye. Leroy. Aye. And I for me as well. One more down, Aaron. Wonderful. Okay, keep burning through these. <clears throat> um. Okay. All right, I'm going to jump to this one next. Um, <clears throat> two requests for continuations. And the first one I'll just really briefly touch on. Um, <clears throat> I went out to take a look at this one today. And um, <clears throat> so I have some concerns with it, the continuation. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's difficult to get into at this late hour and honestly mm -hmm. i i feel like it would almost be better for me and dave zomek and brett to possibly sit down and discuss this um mm -hmm. but basically what i saw when i went out to the site was this this is a project uh it was a uh order of conditions that was issued in 2017 and mm -hmm. it was a basically two lot subdivision at the end of Canton Ave, which is very close to the high school um, mm -hmm. off of uh, Harvard and Whitney Street, I believe. Mm -hmm. And um, I walked the site and mostly what I was going out there to look at was the flagging because whenever we do a continuation, I wanna just see that the wetland boundaries have not changed. And the flagging wasn't super fresh. There were some areas where I did see flagging from the original um, permit that was still hanging there. But what concerned me was um, one of the lots, there had been work that had started there. There was no DEP file number posted. There was no erosion controls installed. It looked like, um, and, and this is, I'm talking very close proximity to the wetlands. Um, it looks like uh, there was, basically um, work had begun there to clear the lot hmm. with no mitigation, no abiding by the permit and um, the flagging in the area was gone. So uh, there was no way for me to see where the wetland was. I think hmm. that the wetland could possibly have been impacted. So 
I don't want to recommend that we issue a continuation on it. I think we need to approach the landowner and say mm -hmm. what's going on here mm -hmm. and try to figure out how to move forward with it, but um, not recommending a continuation at this point. Um, I don't know if others have comments on that, but kind I, of I think you should uh, yeah, probably talk amongst yourselves. Brett, were you on this one? Were you on the commission when this happened? This particular? So this is a very contentious um, site. Um, every neighbor had something to say and it took a long time to get this approved. So um, it still looks like it's in limbo. Why don't we have them go back to the beginning? This one's uh this one that do a lot of replication, you know, rain gardens. Anyway, it's Bucky yeah, Sparkle, it's, right? I, I don't I don't particular I mean, it's my own personal opinion. I don't particularly care for the plan. Um I I I would have um I would have taken issue with a lot of the things on the plan <laughs> if I was reviewing it from scratch. But that's not, you know, I can't go back in time. What I can say is right now there's issues and um, I don't recommend that we continue the permit until we find out what's going on exactly and kind of try to get it get it back in order. Um, and then the commission well, could address it at the next meeting. Maybe we can do an update. Yeah, it took me a minute to place where it was. Um, Fletcher, but oh yeah, I remember there are people very vocal and people eh, not quite yelling at us, but pretty close. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, and I can send out some site visit photos um, and maybe I can send them to um, to Brett and Dave and we could find a time to do a Zoom call and discuss it really briefly um, and figure okay. out the best path forward. But I don't think a continuation. Sounds like you're flagging to start. Uh, but particularly, I mean, if they're not if they're not meeting the current conditions, that's a serious, serious problem. And yeah, yeah. We'll just I mean, we continue. I mean, that's easy something like this should have had a pre-construction meeting. There should have been an erosion control inspection mm -hmm. um, prior to work beginning on the site. Um, there should have been a DP file number posted prior to work beginning on the site. And the wetlands definitely were not marked. So people who are out there working, the wetland boundary is, is I mean, I think that the wetlands were impacted by whatever happened out there. So um, yeah, it's, we've got to take a big a big step back on that one. <laughs> Um, the Pomeroy Lane single family, I'll, I'll just move to the next one, just um, the Pomeroy Lane single family house, this is another continuation and I had asked that the flagging be refreshed on this one too. And I apologize because I went out there and looked, <laughs> but I could not find this lot. It's just, it's, um, it's like a, a pork chop lot that comes off of Pomeroy Lane just to the east of Poor Farm and I just could not figure out where I was even going in and where <laughs> so I have to talk to Mike Lou and either have somebody go out there with me or have them flag where the entrance to the property is because I didn't want to trespass. Um, is this the one that has a long drive a skinny long driveway up? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yep. God, that's a, this is another very difficult very difficult um, site. Yeah, they, and they went through wetlands on that one, and there was no choice. Yes, and, uh, correct. That back lot. It's a weird one. Yeah, and recently, actually, um, Dave sent me a um, a form to review, which is our fees um, that we collect for permits. And one recommendation that I'm definitely going to make is that on these continuations, that we charge more than fifty dollars, particularly if it's a large lot or if it's a subdivision, because this isn't me going out and taking a 15 or 20 minute site walk. This is literally like hours of brush, you know, <laughs> bushwhacking, trying to find flagging. And, um, and I also think that we should be um, really carefully evaluating these before we issue continuances. And I think that, um, you know, Tofino is an excellent example of that. Yep. I think we, I agree. We got burned on that one. Yep. And, yeah. Uh, Yep. Yep. Okay. So that's that. Um, Do we have to, or should we move on those? There's nothing to move on, okay. really. Uh, I've I've got a I've got to do a site visit for Pomeroy Lane and Canton Ave. I want to um, meet internally to discuss how to proceed with that because of the okay. issue on the site. Okay. Um. So monitoring reports, everything is in order with monitoring reports. Um, the one site that has been sort of a question is 
um, I believe it's 45 university drive. So there's, I think it's 45 and 70. And we have these um, ongoing monitoring reports that we are getting from them. And they've repeatedly requested to stop doing the monitoring reports out there. My um, hesitation has been on number 45, which is the, um, the, restaurant site that's immediately adjacent to um, hangar. Mm -hmm. um, so they never did like a finished loam and seed on that site. And so what basically what happened was they finished construction of the building and then they just sort of left it and it grew back with all these weeds. And when the weeds grew back, most of the site is actually fine. Um, with the weeds, it's fairly stable. Um, but in the back of the lot, um, I think it's actually in the area where the dumpster is located. What's happened is the weeds were so sparse that there was all this undercutting, um, these like sort of gullies that were formed in the soil um, on the upland side of the erosion controls. And I said, you know, I really don't like that. And I don't want the I don't want the monitoring to stop because I don't like this erosion that I'm seeing here. And then I said to them, well, are you going to do a finished loam and seed? And they said, well, not this season, maybe in the spring. And I'm thinking, why are we going to stop monitoring if they're going to be loaming and seeding in the spring? And then we're going to be picking it up again. So I told them that they, I recommended that we continue to monitor, but I wanted to present the situation to you guys. I mean, the same situation sort of applies on 70 University Drive because there's a, I don't know if you remember, but there was a electric car charging station that they had amended the permit to include. And when they installed that electric, electric car charging station, they basically tore it up, put in the station, and then they threw down a bunch of um, uh, like, wood chips it was in the middle of the winter last winter and then just left it and so again it's grown up with these weeds and i'm like if they if they stop monitoring they can't come back next year and want to loam and seed it and make it look really nice um and that's kind of what i'm afraid of so it's really you guys call on the monitoring but they're they're kind of annoyed with having to pay for monitoring every week on the site and it's just sitting there and nothing's happening so I wanted to get your perspectives on it. I have no problem with them continuing to monitor. Yeah, I mean, I'm <laughs> I not- agree. I, I agree. Yeah. yeah, I guess my only thought was, do we need it every single week or is there like some kind right. of compromise? That's fair enough, yeah. I mean, yeah, are they- do it once a month? I mean, Aaron? Yeah. I, I they are weekly. Once, once a month. Yeah. Especially now, because I mean, Actually, no, now it's going to be the worst time. I was going to say because the ground's going to freeze, but it's not going to. So, I mean, I could tell them once a month as long as no work is going on, but as soon as work is happening on the site, sure. they have to go back to weekly. Yeah. Good. Good. Sounds good to me. There goes Larry. Bye, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just taking care of my printing processes. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm doing two things at once. <laughs> Okay, so the other thing, um, just wanted to give you a quick update on complaints. Um, I did get a complaint um, a couple weeks ago now um, for uh, cordwood cutting that was going on um, in the vicinity of Pulpit Hill Road and Mill Street. Um, and I'm talking very minor. Um, there was, I think, three or four logs that were like felled um, dead snags that somebody went out and cut up with a chainsaw. And then there was one tree, which was a larger diameter, but it was definitely a live tree that was cut, that was cut, um, possibly to be used as firewood adjacent to the wetlands back there. So maybe four trees total, um, three of them were dead that were cut up in sections for, for firewood. Um, I went out, uh, this, the individual who complained, I went out, took pictures. Um, I'm in the process of responding to the complaint with a letter to the landowners, basically addressing it. But 
but what it um, alerted me to was that one of the landowners that are in that strip had had an enforcement order last June, I believe. Um, and they had done a bunch of cutting on their neighbor's property and they had gotten an enforcement order and they were supposed to do a restoration plan. And I'm not sure whatever happened. It just, I think Beth was leaving and I was coming and uh, got kind of lost in the shuffle. So there's two correspondence that I sent to Dave and I'm working on getting out the door, which are basically to let the landowners know they can't cut firewood back there in the wetland and number two, an update on the enforcement situation. So that's one of the complaints. Another complaint is a driveway um, that was installed um, out on West Pomeroy without a permit. And so, but the, the kind of complicating factor was the deep that DPW had issued a curb cut for it. So the landowner may not have known that they needed a permit from conservation. So Dave Z and I are working on um, getting in contact with them and following up. But just to kind of give you a heads up that those things were um, happening, but I didn't want to waste too much of your time with it. Just give you a, kind of a quick, quick and dirty update. Appreciate it. And Yeah, thanks. And that property was a weird one. So where they were trespassing. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And I think that's all my all the items that I wanted to cover tonight. Excellent. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks for always being very well prepared and moving us through. So any other business anybody wants to talk about? If not, looking for everybody's favorite motion. <laughs> Move to Move to adjourn. Second. Fletcher, how do you vote? I say aye. Larry. Aye. Laura. Oh, not sure about Laura. Leroy? Aye. So I guess Laura abstains. So, but I vote aye. <laughs> no, no, I'm here. I'm sorry. You know, my, my daughter didn't lose her tooth. She just swallowed her tooth. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Just it Laura, just say I and we're, we call it good. I, it'll sorry. all come yeah. out in the end. It'll I, uh, all come out in the end. There was just screaming <laughs> and uh, hit a loose tooth, and it was uh, like she just swallowed it, and there's pandemonium at the moment. So that's exciting, and congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> I say I. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, we're so we are officially journey. closed. <laughs> I so think a special one. tooth fairy should come tonight. Yeah. yeah, no, I think you get extra dough for uh, swallowing your tooth, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, you get extra dough for the one who, yeah. Puts it under their pillow. Yeah. Well, I don't know 